Mississippi is still a very rough place, you know. Um, people is not just walking up like they used to do in the past, walking out, you know, shooting a man down or getting maybe two or three hundred people carrying you out and lynching you, but it's it's in a most subtle way. Um, you know, they can let you starve to death, not give you jobs. These are some of the things that's happening right now in Mississippi. Taking trips uh, like this one to the Delta, Mississippi Delta, um, I believe it's important because uh, it helps us to step back in history and look at the footprint of God uh, as God moved among an oppressed group of people uh, to do an amazing thing uh, in working uh, towards their liberation and their freedom. of your father, and I said, no, I'm stepping in the shoes of Jesus Christ. My father might have missed his step. assassinated all that so Miss Fanny Lou Heyman was a great warrior here at William Chapel like I said she had the courage to stand up and that's one of the messages I tried to bring to William Chapel you have to stand alone stand for what's right because when what's wrong go down everything with it is gonna go down also. One of several examples of music that occurred following the slave trade. Africans taken out of their homeland, away from their cultural roots, there were distributed, uh, and many of them brought together who hadn't previously known each other. Somebody from the Congo, somebody from Angola, and ended up on a plantation somewhere in, in Alabama. understand that as people, as African American people, when we came here, um, in a way an identity was imposed on us that, that would allow us to fit into being exploited for our labor, 
um, exploited for economic benefit of others, but that's not who we are. And um, our cultural art practices are a vessel that can help us to understand who we are, the way we move the way we sing, the way we dress, the way we eat, the way we talk. Uh, those are things that we brought with us. Um, our languages were removed, but sort of the rhythm behind our language is still there. And uh, the ways in which we um, hold our family structures and even the ways that we dance and the ways that we sing are all African. And so um, as a director of a cultural arts center in here, here in Clarksdale, Mississippi, the home of the Blues, uh, Crossroads Cultural Arts Center, it's very important for me that we recognize that the music we call blues is really just a chapter in a very long oral history. We come from people who were oral. Um, our traditions are oral. We kept history orally, and that started before uh, written history started. And we kept music uh, through the griots, the musical historians, also known by some groups as the Mavos or the Jollies or the Jellies. And these are people, men and women, who were charged with singing our culture and singing our history and passing those songs on through the generations in order to document our history. And so that practice of the griot traveled across the ocean in the Middle Passage and it was reborn as the blues. And so the blues singers are really griots. They're oral historians. They are those who sing of our history when we arrived in America. And today they're still singing of our history. And so it's really important that we understand that the music we call blues is not just something to dance to. It's not just entertainment, but it is, um, it is the way by which we can continue to document our history and look back upon our history, not only in America, but in our history before we came to America. In order for us to heal as people and to remember who we are, we have to understand that our history did not start in slavery, that uh, our history started long before slavery. And as a good uh, African musician and historian friend of mine says, not only did our history not start in slavery, our history started before slavery, but our history is the history of all humankind. And so um, it's important for our children to know you did not start as a slave. I, we, there's so much more to who we are. And especially with the climate of things that are going on, right now in the United States, it's vital for us to know who we are and for us to show through our art forms, through our representation, show the world who we really are. Because this misidentification of us leads to violence, it leads to oppression, it leads to us uh, uh, enacting violence upon ourselves, it leads to our children not knowing their potential. And so we have to really use our music, our art, our fashion, our design to create an identity that really reflects our whole truth and our healthy truth. And so that's what I hope we can be a part of the uh, cultural revolution where we can really recognize um, the wholeness of who we are in this The Delta has such a rich history. Uh, there's so many um, creative and talented people that have come from the Delta. Hi, my name is Tina Anderson. I'm the executive director here at Griot Arts in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Um, so Griot Arts has been around for about 10 years, and so we focus on a few things, mostly art, for after school, for our, for our community, our community of, of amazing students, whether that's visual art, whether that's dance, whether that's band. Um, so we have different kind of art focuses, African drum as well. So I have an amazing art director, Isabella Dallas, that runs that. Our other core program is Meraki. So this is the space that I'm in now, um, where we have a practical learning environment. So if you can imagine Starbucks. So that's sort of the space in place. But it's really important to our community because it brings the community together, it brings our tourists together so we can share stories, um, just share life in general over coffee, over tea, whatever that is. So my director for our workforce development
Enrichment Program that is Meraki is uh, Ben Lewis. So a part of that, we have 16 weeks with our fellows. Um, these are students that they may be in school, they may be um, what they consider opportunity youth, not in school. And so they're needing um, additional work experience. So they come here, spend 16 weeks with us, they get work experience along with the curriculum that we take them through that includes uh, customer service, communication skills, financial literacy, the whole gamut. Um, so again, being a part of the community, Rio Arts is, is, is what that is. So Rio's are West African storytellers. We like to keep the story of our communities. We like to encourage our students, our youth, to be a part of that and to be culture keepers. Meraki literally means um, love, creativity, and soul. So whatever they're doing, they're doing it with those three things. So. Perhaps the greatest embodiment of the spirit of Christ in the history of this nation has been the black people in the black church. Because the white side of our culture has been based on power and dominance. And no greater proof of that than white evangelicalism right this day and time. That's, to me, it's just like, well, it's not hidden, is it? <laughs> Finally, about time. Because the white side of our culture, they say, oh, wait a minute, you can't be there, you can't say that, that's un-American, that's unpatriotic. I'm a child of the kingdom. I'm not an American first. No Christian should ever be an American first. That's not where our loyalties are. So, going back to my own childhood, um, I can remember, I can remember like my mom telling me, and not just my mom, but like my mom, my aunts, other adults, telling me to be very mindful of how, you know, I carry myself, right? To, if I went in certain stores, or no, if I went in any store, to get a receipt, right? If I, you know, don't draw attention to yourself, this and that, even in this place, right? Even in this little town, this community, because, even as, you know, even in the 90s, 80s, 90s and going forward, you still had this, this blanket or this, this identity concerning oppression. You still had this, you know, this was, a, this was basically a white space. This was a white town. And, and outside of the Emmett Till murder, to my knowledge, you didn't hear a lot of other race-based incidences, but you had this flag that was flying. You had vehicles that had three state of Tallahatchie on, on the little, you know, not lights plate, but like little stickers or whatever. And so it left me feeling like, you know, I, I, I in turn have to be very mindful of, 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 of this, of the spaces I'm taking up. So to the best of my ability to decrease the likelihood of something bad happening, you know, I did certain things or I spoke a certain way or I you know, was very mindful of the company I kept and things of that nature because I, I had reason to believe based off of the climate, <laughs> even in the 90s, you know, that, that if I'm accused of something or, or God forbid I get into it with somebody, I can't speak to the guarantee that justice would be given to me in an equitable fashion. So, and that's a truth that a lot of black folk here and other places have, have always had to wrestle with is the fact that, you know, you, you may share you know, space with folks, but you're still living in different worlds. The sites that we got to visit during that trip uh, just really put 
things into perspective for me uh, in terms of our history and the progress that we've made as a society and in our culture. Uh, mainly the courthouse that we visited where the Emmett Till trial took place. Getting, getting to be in that space where two very guilt, guilty men got to get off for the murder of a little boy who really did nothing, uh, his only crime was being black, uh, was truly impactful. Uh, getting to hear the stories of people who were directly impacted by that and being alive and being young people themselves uh, truly made an impact on me. The uh, visit to the Emmett Till uh, site uh, to where uh, his body was dragged from Black Bottom River uh, reminded me of so many African Americans that have suffered at the hands of cruelty uh, simply because they asserted their human dignity and felt as if they had the same uh, rights that uh, white people had. But because uh, the Southern way felt necessary to put uh, such people back in their place, often they ended up at the end of a rope or at the bottom of a river. I thought it was really um, interesting to have the mayor at the Emmett Till Memorial while we were there uh, touring it. It was real special to hear his account of that night and um, just to hear his story of being in the actual place that historical events happened. Um, I think it's very important that we talk to people who are actually in these spaces to truly understand the magnitude of the events that have happened. Though they may seem like they happened a long time ago, um, it's actually not that far. And when we talk to these people, we can kind of connect the dots and figure out ways that we can march forward today. So I think him sharing that story was very special to me as a young person, being able to move forward, as well as just understanding the difficulties that go into um, holding up memorials like that in terms of finance and dedication and determination and people being willing to actually do the work to uphold these memories and these sacred spaces that need to be upheld. It's very important and being able to talk to the mayor and just understand his um, concept of activism, it was really impactful for me. The traveling exhibit, we intended to take what we have here, this timeline, all the way from 1860, all the way to now. And we consider ourselves a living museum, meaning that uh, we are upgrading all the time. You probably wind up in it, uh, but you uh, history. Especially if we do what we're supposed to do, young folks, and to go into and delve into uh, gathering our intellectual property before our parents and grandparents and all those leave away from us.
Having the opportunity to be able to tour the Civil Rights Museum was truly life-changing. Uh, being able to experience that at my age, uh, at this stage of my life, really forced me to re-examine how I grew up and what I thought I knew, and just to re-examine my own identity as a black man in America and my own experiences growing up and how I can better be prepared to handle that and to address those issues moving forward. I was telling the lady who was sitting there earlier, I probably could do everything that I did back in the day, but don't send me to Parchment. Not even today? Not even today. Now, how old were you when you were at Parchment? Uh, 13. 13. 13. Mm -hmm. So you were at Parchment for, you said, five days, mm -hmm. um, and you continued to be involved. Uh, what was the organizational structure like when, 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 when you guys were doing the Freedom Rides? Well, at 13, sir, to be honest with you and all of you mm -hmm. here, um, I was not a Freedom Rider at 13. Okay. Uh, I want to clear that up. I was arrested at 13 by being nosy. <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, I wanted to, I had heard so much Right. about the Freedom Riders, where I saw on TV, on the national news. And what I saw was very interesting to me at an early age because my mom, my teachers and friends are supposedly community leaders. No one wanted to talk about the Freedom Riders. That was a hush, hush word. But my curiosity, was greater than their hush hush. Mm -hmm. So I had a friend who was who felt the same way. Right. We would watch the news in the afternoon. We would see the Freedom Riders in Alabama being beaten, being spat on, uh, being hosed down. And I thought, and I still feel the same way. If you spit on me, I'm going to retaliate. All right. I'm talking about at my age now. <laughs> okay. And I, I couldn't figure out these young folks uh, having individuals to spat on them, and they wouldn't do nothing. Right, right. I'm saying, man, what kind of mm. stuff is this, real? <laughs> What's really going on? What's really, What's going, really going on? on? Right. <laughs> so, all of that type of uh, activity caught my attention, mm -hmm. and. One day we heard that they was coming to Jackson. Mm -hmm. So my friend said, man, we need to go to the Masonic Temple uh, where Mega um, mm -hmm. office was held. Uh, we need to go over there and, and just take a look at them. Right. And that's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to look at a freedom rider to see what he or she looked like, wow. to see what he or she dressed like the whole nine y'all. Mm -hmm. So we get to the Masonic Temple and the Freedom Riders was breaking up their meeting. And the presenter was saying, are there anyone here who would like to join forces with these Freedom Riders? And if so, meet us at the Greyhound bus station. But well, we didn't have no car. We had a bicycle though. All right. So we got on our bicycle and we <laughs> go to the Greyhound bus station. We get there, no one is there. Hmm. So my friend and I, we walk in the sidewalk. I mean, it was no traffic in terms of cars, walking, no pedestrian, no nothing. What time wow. of day was this or night? This was early. This was. Um, it was before it was it was full dark because I had to be home. The light came. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Well, so I had to be home before the night. That's what I'm looking at. And um, 
my friend and I, we walking down the sidewalk trying to look inside of the bus station. We couldn't see anything. And on the way back up, for some reason, um, my friend pushed me inside. Mm. And when I was pushed inside, it was a big old sign that read, whites only. Oh, wow. And I'm saying, oh, oh Lord. So I went to turn to run out. And this person grabbed me on my shoulder. I looked up. It was a police officer. And he asked, why are you in here? And I politely told him, uh, my friend out there pushed me in here. <laughs> he said, where? I said, he's out there. So he caught me by the wrist, led me on the outside and said, where? I look left, I look right. He was calm. No friends to be found. <laughs> no friends to be found. <laughs> so led me back in and said, I have another one over here. Oh, good. And um, I could hear footsteps, which was other officers in the bus station, but in a different area. And they, you could hear the footsteps and they ran over to our location. And they asked me two questions, uh, your name and your birthplace. I gave them my name and my birthplace just happened to be Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay, that whereas my daddy, Moved my mother and my two older brothers to Wisconsin for a better life. It was during the migration period. And um, then I came along. And three years later, my father died. And my mother had to make a decision. Do I move back to Mississippi or do I stay in Wisconsin? So she chose to move back to Mississippi. And by my saying, my birthplace was Milwaukee, Wisconsin. They automatically assumed that I was a Freedom Rider wow. because the Freedom Rider was coming from up north. Mm -hmm. And they put me in a paddy wagon and I was taken to the state prison uh, and Just put like on that. death row um, mm -hmm. at 13, put in a cell with two other males, grown males, mm -hmm. seasoned, Right. Male, okay, yes. yeah, and um, probably uh, the worst time of my life was those five days that I spent in Boston that appeared to be five months, um, all kinds of things imaginable um, happened to me at 13. Um, um, but I survived it, okay. I think that's the main thing. I survived it, and I still have my sanity, and um, I, I believe I still have my dignity. Mm -hmm. What a tremendous blessing this has been for us to spend this time together in the Mississippi Delta, revisiting the history and looking at our past with the intention of merging our souls, minds, hearts, and spirits together to build a future history together across lines of race. And we pray that God will give us the commitment and the desire and the inspiration to do just that. It is there at that point of intense pain and suffering, the recognition of it, that we can uh, somehow exercise a collective compassion to be able to feel for those who suffered there, who, uh, whose blood drenched that soil, uh, their sweat watered the ground upon which they had to work, and to go back there uh, with a collective imagination to feel what they felt and to come away with a common commitment to do all that we can in our power to make sure that we don't ever, ever uh, go through that horrific uh, passage of suffering. Um, and so it also gives us motivation and inspiration uh, to work together spiritually, uh, to create and to develop a common future together 
as we can blend our imagination together as we look back at history we then come back to our present state of where we are now and continue to blend our imagination of a better future, a more humane future, a future that has enough space to include the humanity of all people.